morning, DevOps. Wow. First time here and already an almost completely filled room. It's great. Uh, welcome to my talk. Um, the talk is called Testing Done Right from Bugs to Brilliance. Uh, so if you don't know how to test already, you have two choices. One, you can start learning right now or you can start looking for another job. Now, of course, we're not only going to talk about testing, we're going to talk about software quality in general. So first of all, I'm going to talk about some pre prerequisites for quality. Then I'm going to touch one of the team best practices you can implement. And then obviously, we're going to talk about automated testing. Now, why should I be talking about automated testing? What was the, pr the reason that I started preparing this talk? Is that, especially here in Belgium, I can't speak for other countries, most colleges where they teach programming courses or other organizations that teach programming courses, they treat testing like it's not that important. They just say like, hey, here, this is JUnit. Uh, you can use it for testing. This is an example of a unit test, and that's all they say about testing. And then you go into the job, you go into the field, and they say, yeah, you should be doing test-driven. And uh, test what? So that's what I'm going to try to talk about today. Um, I'm, gonna, I, I'm not going to tell you how you should be writing your tests, but more about how you should be tackling your testing. Who am I? My name is Wouter. I work at the Beehive, a Belgian company, as full-stack developer. Uh, I'm also a former lecturer at Karel de Grote Community College here in Antwerp. Um, yeah, I love Kotlin, but most of the time I'm writing Java. And yeah, because I'm talking about quality, for me, quality is the key to, su to success. The QR code, it's a, a link to Linktree, where uh, I have put some of my socials and also my GitHub repository. Uh, so you can scan it. If you don't have your phone right now, I, it will uh, come back later in the slides. Now, quality. Why do we need quality? Yeah, we have to, tr we have to try to raise the bar every single day. First of all, we owe it to ourselves because, yeah, development is an art and we should be proud of what we're doing. We also owe it to our company and to our customers or to the end users using the software that we're writing because, at last, they're the ones paying us. Now, how do we achieve software quality? Yeah, I already told we are going to start with some prerequisites and we'll explore two of them today. The first of them are good requirements. Now, to write code for our customers, we need to know what we should be writing. Every one of us can invent their own features, but eventually that will not be what the customer wants us to write. So the requirements should provide us with context so that we understand the actual problem, and it has to also has to describe the outcome of the feature that, we're, we'll, that we will be writing. So the requirements should be created by or at least together with the business we're working for. It can be a business stakeholder, like someone who works for the company, uh, but it also can be a, an analyst. Because, yeah, why should I be involved? It is their problem that we are going to solve. Now, there are some things that I often see in requirements that I really don't like to see in them, like yeah, technical implementation details uh, or diagrams or even the database structure that we should, that we should be implementing. Please leave, uh, tell your analysts to leave that to the technical team. We are the specialists. We know how to implement stuff. Enough about requirements. Um, we also need acceptance criteria. The requirements are not enough. They provide us with context, but yeah, they're often too long, and everyone knows TLDR. We have that with requirements. So we need to know exactly what conditions should be met by the software we are writing. We need acceptance criteria. We need good acceptance criteria. And there are some rules that they should follow. First of all, they should be written from end user perspective. Acceptance criteria should describe which step a user has to fulfill to reach a certain outcome. Acceptance criteria must also be clear, they must be understandable, and preferably they should be written in a domain-specific language so that not only the technical team understands them, but also the business understands it. There should be no room for assumption in acceptance criteria because we all know acceptance criteria, um, assumption is the root of all evil. Acceptance criteria should not contain obsolete details because they, they will avoid, uh, they will cause confusion 
by the additional information provided. Let's look at an example for that. I have two acceptance criteria. The one on the left is a long one. When a registered user fills out the username and password field and afterwards clicks the login button, then he is logged in and gets redirected to the dashboard. The one on the right is more concise. It says, when a registered user logs in, his personal dashboard is displayed. Now raise your hands. Who prefers the left one? Some people do prefer the left one. Now, yeah, the other, person, uh, the other people in the room may also raise their hands. Who prefers the right one? Good. Obviously, for me, the right one is the best. Why? The login functionality is out of scope for this ticket. This ticket is about redirecting a logged in user to his dashboard. So the only part is that after the login, we are redirected to our dashboard. I already mentioned before, acceptance criteria should describe the outcome. Um, what do we want as a result from the system? We don't need all the steps to be described in the acceptance criteria. We just need the outcome. And last but not least, acceptance criteria should be testable. Not only for our testers who use the acceptance criteria as a baseline for their tests, but also for us. We need a list of all the things that we should be implementing. For the testers, this list should not be exhaustive. Testers are well-trained people that know how to test an application, and yeah, they can invent their own additional test cases. Enough about acceptance criteria and requirements. Code reviews is a team best practice that I would love to see implemented in every team, at least code reviews. Um, it's not enough to write your code and merge it. Your teammates should be looking at your code. Why? We have the four eyes principle. I think everyone in the room knows it. Four eyes see more than two eyes. So when you're done writing code, let one of your peers check your code, give feedback, give suggestions to improve your code, and yeah, the result will be better. Now, I said code reviews are the least you should be implementing. If you even want to go further, dive into pair programming. Now, enough about the team practices and about the prerequisites. From now on, I'm going to talk about the quality of our implementation. Does our code work as we want it to work? Does everything we have written integrate well with each other? How are we going to verify it? Will we wait for our testers to verify it? Well, I hope, we, I hope no one in the room does, because that will cost us so much time. No, we should be doing this ourselves. One thing we can do is test everything manually on our machine. We should be testing the code we've written manually on our, on our machine. But we have to write automated tests so that they can, they can be run over and over and over again, even in our build pipelines. Now, let's see about what you guys think about it. Who has written tests before? Who writes tests every single day? Still a lot of hands, not everyone. Who thinks unit tests are the most important kind of test to write? Well, th there are still some hands going up, but I like it that not everyone is raising his hands. Now, who thinks integration or end-to-end -end tests are the most important tests to write? Great. Yeah, thank you for uh, being here. That's all. Uh, I don't have any mo I think anything more to say. So, no, just kidding. Um, I'm not going to talk about how you should be writing your tests. Um, I'm going to talk about which test we should be writing. And I know some of the terminology is not clear for everyone, um, especially the definition of a unit. Uh, I've started this, a discussion on LinkedIn a few weeks ago, um, and yeah, it was very interesting. There are some different opinions about what is a unit, um, but to do that, we're going to look at some of the important types so we get a common understanding about how I see it. So we have different kinds of tests. I mentioned the three most important for me here. I know there are others, but there, these are the ones that we as developers are writing or should be writing every single day. 
Let's start with the end-to-end -end, end -end tests. These are the tests that test our entire application. Most of the time, we start in the front end by automating a process and by, with uh, engines like Cucumber or something, uh, where we simulate that a user does something in our application. And we perform an API call to our backend. We uh, check, and afterwards we check the response, obviously, but we can also check what happens in the database and if the correct messages are sent out of the system. Then we have the integration tests. Uh, that are tests that test the integration of our components, of our classes, uh, that test the integration with our database or with messaging systems. So they verify that a flow in our backend, the entire flow in the backend, in one component of our application, is good. And then obviously we have the unit tests. Um, it's the smallest possible test, it's quite easy to write, and they run extremely fast. But here's the discussion, what is a unit? What piece of code are we testing, and how do we deal with dependencies? Now, there are two major approaches defined by someone named Martin Fowler. Probably no one in the room knows him, but yeah. He had a good, a good image about it, so I thought uh, I would include it in my talk. Um, the first of all, are the, uh, the first of the two types are the sociable tests. They run with less isolation, they accept dependencies in our code, and they try to avoid replacing those dependencies by test doubles. So they actually test the real behavior of our code. Then we have the solitary unit tests. The, those are the isolated tests. They run each on their own, isolated from each other. Um, and most of the time, they replace all the dependencies with test doubles, like mocks and stubs with libraries, uh, like Mokito or, or PowerMock. But yeah, they test the actual implementation of our class. Mark that I use the word implementation. They don't test the behavior. Now, which is best? Yeah, it's kind of a flavor. Uh, it also depends somewhat on the use case uh, of the class you're testing. Um, yeah, so both of solitary and um, sociable unit tests are kind of important. Now, there's one thing you should always try to avoid. It's a terrible disease. Uh, it's a disease called mokitis. It's um, yeah, one of the most important symptoms of mokitis is uh, that you're mocking too much. Your mocking makes you depend on the specific implementation of your class, and it leads to when you start refactoring your code that a massive amount of tests will start failing. And one of the things you don't want when you're refactoring is that you have failing tests. Now, enough about the types of tests. Let's see at some approaches we can use to implement the features our customer wants. And let me start with the most important one, code first. Now, I hope everyone here heard the sarcasm in my voice. Code first is a thing you should always try to avoid. I know. Generative AI tools like uh, Copilot or the JetBrains AI, they provide the feature that you can generate tests from your code. But keep in mind, when the code you've written contains a bug, the tests that, you'll, that the tool will generate will check for that bug to exist in your code. If you fix the bug, the test will fail. That's not a thing you want. Now, why should we still, uh, what are the other reasons that we should be avoiding it? Well, if you're writing all your code first and then start testing afterwards, you will probably forget to test some parts of the code. Writing your tests first helps you to think about what you should be implementing. Now, let's look at a small example. It's a real-life example. I didn't invent this myself. It's a simple feature where you get the server time from the server. Sometimes, yeah, in some use cases, you need to keep your front end in sync, yeah, the clock of the front end in sync with uh, the clock of the back end. So it's an easy endpoint, a simple endpoint, where you just return an instant, yeah, the current timestamp using a clock. Now, what the developer that, has that was writing this has written, uh, delivered as a test was this one. The test succeeded, so it was green. The, the, the build was okay, everything works fine. Eh, let's merge this. But 
this isn't testing what we wanted to test. We are testing the Java class instant, not our controller. So don't test like this. This is how the test should have been. Test that the controller is invoked and verify, validate the return value. Now, if you, we can't write our code first and the test afterwards, what should we be doing? Yeah, we should be writing our test first, and test first leads to test-driven development. Let's look at how this process works. First of all, it's a cycle. We can repeat the cycle over and over and over again until our feature is complete. The cycle is quite simple. It has three steps, red, green, refactor. Let's break them down for the ones who don't know them. First of all, the red is we start by writing a failing test. A test that you write should always fail because you don't have an implementation yet. And I've heard people say, but yeah, how can I run this test because it doesn't compile? Well, a compilation failure is also a failing test. Once you have the failing test, you can start writing the implementation. Write code just enough to make sure that your test passes and nothing more. Then we can go to the refactoring to improve our code. We can improve the naming. Uh, we can um, introduce some abstractions or uh, even um, yeah, rewrite the code to use some design patterns. But as I mentioned before, the tests should keep working. If you're done, start over and write a failing test again. Now, we're testing, but which tests should, be, should be we be writing? Um, most of us will know the testing pyramid. It's a very common shape. Um, it's a good base to start from. Um, it's a combination of different types of tests. And these are the tests that we as developers will be writing most of the time. I have to mention, in a lot of teams, the end-to-end -end testing is done by test engineers. Now, how should uh, we decide how many of each type we should be writing? Well, if you look at the pyramid, you see at the base, it's wider than at the top. So we are writing, most of the time, we are writing a lot of unit tests, um, fewer integration tests, and even less end-to-end -end tests. Why? It's quite simple. The higher we get in the pyramid, there are some things that are increasing. The cost for the test will increase because it takes longer to run them, but it also takes longer to write them. The higher you go in the pyramid, the complexer it gets to write the test. Now, there's also one good thing about getting higher in the pyramid. The higher we go, the more confident we can be that this test really checks that our code, that our application works. However, end-to-end -end tests, they are often based on uh, selectors by CSS classes or something. Um, when you change something in a CSS class, or oh, change the name uh, in a refactoring, and you forget to update the test, yeah, then your test will obviously break. Now, test-driven development has some advantages. First of all, it makes sure that we have a better understanding of the problem and of the code that we are writing. Um, it also makes sure that we maintain a decent Test, co test coverage, that we test enough of our code. Um, I, I'm not saying that we should be testing 100%, um, but we should uh, agree within our team uh, what is uh, the acceptable level that we should strive for. It also increases developer productivity, um, so it makes sure that we can implement new features faster because we understand the context of the, pr uh, of the problem and because we're cutting the, the problem down in small pieces and small blocks, the implementation goes faster. Now, yeah, it also makes sure that our code is more maintainable, especially when we're writing good tests, because when we start refactoring, our tests should validate that our refactoring did not break the functionality. Now, obviously, there are some pitfalls. Um, the first is that it requires a lot of discipline. It requires discipline from every developer in the team because test-driven is something that you need to be actively doing. We have to force ourselves to write a test first. We have to force ourselves to stick to the code we need um, to make the test pass and not 
to go further than that, even if we're in the flow. Test-driven development has some learning curve. Eh? That, that's why I started this talk. Many junior developers don't really know how to, proper, uh, how to write proper tests. So they have to learn this. They have to learn how to do TDD. Um, yeah, the tests are also code, so yeah, the tests also need some maintenance. Um, so we need to do more maintenance of our code. Um, but tests can also provide a false sense of security. Remind the example I gave about the server time. If we have the first test, yeah, that's a false sense of security because that test will always pass even if we change the implementation of our controller. And then last of it, Test-driven development focuses on unit testing, especially when applying the testing pyramid. So is the testing pyramid bad? No, it's a good place to start. But if you want to raise the bar, I want to introduce you to another shape. We have the testing pyramid. We all know it. Now, this is a shape by Ken C. Dots. Um, it has some similarities. We have the same colors. We have the same types of testing. But we see that the shape has changed, um, that the, the base is not the most important anymore. And we also see that there is a new layer added. Um, let's talk about this layer, this new layer first, eh, about static testing. Um, don't be afraid. Static, te static testing is not about writing additional code. It's related to automated tools that most of us will already be using without even knowing it except maybe the few in here that might be using VI as their preferred IDE. So the first of all is our Java compiler. The Java compiler verifies that our code is syntactically correct and that all classes that we use are available on the class path. Most IDEs also provide some spell checking or some, yeah, yeah, spell checking. Uh, grammar checking is not that important code. Um, this helps us to find typos in our code. Uh, this works especially good when you're writing code in English. Um, if you're writing code in Dutch, like we have to do sometimes, believe me, this doesn't always work as expected. Then we also have linting tools, like for example, ESLint in Frontend, um, where we check that our code follows conventions, follows some predefined rules, um, or even some custom rules that we uh, created our own. And then the last one is Sonar Cloud. For example, Sonar Cloud or, or other providers available. Um, they run checks on our code, um, also by uh, predefined and custom rules uh, that we can turn on and off. And they, they discover complexity in our code, bad structure, even possible bugs. And one of the most useful, to, um, useful things is that they provide language migration aids. Um, for example, when uh, you're still writing Java 8 and you migrate to uh, Java 17 uh, gradually, some things have changed, some things got better, some things can be written more concise or more readable. Sonar Cloud will highlight them so you can take action. Now, the rest of the talk will be about testing eh? even more, but more in particular, integration testing. The testing trophy has more focus on more integrated tests. Uh, these tests can be both um, sociable unit tests or real integration tests where you integrate with your database. Um, so less focus on the solitary unit tests, more focus on more integrated testing. Uh, but why should we, should we be writing more integrated testing? Because it takes longer. Well, actually, they do speed us up. One test covers an entire path throughout our application. Integration tests or more integrated tests are also less prone to break when we start refactoring. When we're writing solitary unit tests, um, yeah, if we extract a piece of code to uh, another class or to a method, uh, another method in a class, um, our, co our test will break because this behavior is not yet mocked. We have to mock it again. We are depending on our implementation. We're not validating our behavior. So if we are going to write integration tests or sociable unit tests, we are more going to test the behavior, which is a good thing. 
Now, integration tests also help us um, detect issues with integrations with our database. Um, for example, you're developing against an in-memory H2 database, uh, and your production environment will run against PostgreSQL. Um, believe me, I've been there. It can be hard to make the switch, especially when you, uh, you start using specific syntax for H2, which isn't available in the database you're going to, going to use on production. Integration testing are also a great tool to reproduce bugs. I think everyone here ever had that the, the confidence that the code he delivered was very good, was quality, was perfect, was working perfect. The tester would not find any bugs, and then ding dong, the tester on the door. Hey, I found an issue in your code. Have you thought about this? Well, what should we be doing in that case? We write an integration test for that specific case that we write with the expected output, and then we can start debugging. Um, we can start writing the fix, and we have that automated test in our code base now, so we are sure that that specific bug won't return in the future. There's even more. However, we're already writing integration tests that focus on behavior. We can still do better. Therefore, we're now going to look at behavior-driven development a little and what it can do for us. Behavior-driven development not only involves the developers, it involves other stakeholders, like, for example, the testers, um, or even, and more important, the business. We need those acceptance criteria I talked about in the beginning of the talk. So we need our analyst or the business stakeholder to provide those acceptance criteria, criteria for us. And if, they, uh, if the business is not writing them themselves, they should at least validate the acceptance criteria that were written by an analyst. Because, again, they have to be happy with the feature. It is their problem we are solving. Now, this collaboration between the different stakeholders leads to an improved confidence in the team and within the team. Now, for behavior-driven development, the acceptance criteria are the starting point. Um, we will translate all those accept acceptance criteria in behavior tests that verify the behavior of that specific feature. We will validate it explicitly as it was described in the acceptance criteria. Another, another advantage of behavior-driven development can be that we can do it in a human-readable format, uh, like the syntax most of us know, the Gherkin syntax with keywords like given, when, then, uh, where we can formulate a readable, a human-readable acceptance criteria. We can translate that into automated tests. Now, here is the typical behavior-driven development cycle, and you see test-driven development is still a part of it. Behavior-driven development is not a, re a replacement of TDD. It's a match made in heaven. We should be combining them, because this will skyrocket our quality. And, obviously, it will increase the team's productivity. How are we going to combine it? Well, on the right side, we have the test-driven development cycle, but we're going to start on the left by writing a failing feature test, and then once that test fails, we are going to start, uh, start applying TDD uh, until the feature test is green. And then, if required, we can even refactor some more. And then we start over and over and over again until every acceptance criteria is tested and all the tests are green. Now, one of the tools you could be using for behavior-driven development is Mock MVC. So you don't always need to learn a new framework or a new library. Now, Mock MVC is built in, in the, the Spring testing libraries, um, where we're going to call the endpoints so we can validate security, that we can trigger validation. Um, we're going to execute the entire code flow. Um, we can validate changes in our database and uh, verify the external communication with other systems we depend on. Now, let's look at a small example. Let's say we're building an order system. Um, where the order service uses a product catalog to retrieve product details, 
And uh, when an order is created, uh, it is obviously persisted, persisted in a database. This is how a typical mock MVC test could look like. Um, it's a small example um, where we're doing some setup. Yeah, we an annotate the class with uh, the Spring Boot test annotation uh, and with the uh, auto configure mock MVC. We inject the mock MVC object and then we're going to do some setup on our data um, by injecting uh, it directly into the database like I did here. But we could also write SQL scripts that we could um, provide to Spring that um, when we use the correct annotation, uh, that before the test, it is inserted into the database. And then, obviously, afterwards, we're, we're calling the API endpoint, and we are validating the response that we um, got the correct product back from the API. Now, I talked about doing it in a human re readable format, and that's a thing that can't really be achieved with mock MVC because it is still code. So, yeah, there's more. And that is another framework we should be learning if, we're one, if we really want to use behavior-driven development. Um, there are some frameworks available, and Cucumber is one of the most known behavior-driven development framework. Um, with the right plugin in IntelliJ, we can even um, make a link between the feature files we're writing and the actual code that is linked to them. Uh, so that we as a developer can easily navigate, uh, but still the features themselves are readable for non-technical persons. So let's, re let's rework the previous example a little. I'm not going to show the full code because that would be a little too much. On the QR code that I displayed before and that I will display again in the end, is a link to my GitHub where I have a repository with a full example of um, this test and even more. So we start out by writing the feature file. Um, so we describe the feature to be implemented. Um, we can describe it in one or more scenarios and we use the Gherkin syntax. Uh, as you can see, uh, I'm using the, the right plugin, the Cucumber plugin in IntelliJ and the keywords are recognized and they're highlighted. Um, so this example will be the retrieval of the product with a certain ID and we expect that it matches uh, an existing product. So our application, our API call should return the expected status code but also contain the expected product. This is an example of how a step could look like. You see um, uh, the library contains some annotations where we just put some text in that matches uh, a part of our feature. And in this step, we implement the code specific for this step. What has to be done in this step? Um, so the Cucumber library will um, combine all those steps into runnable tests um, that by recognizing the feature files, by reading uh, all the, the lines of, the, of it and looking up the right steps and it weaves them together um, to make the full test run and it will um, check everything. <coughs> this example, yeah, that's the actual retrieval of the product. Um, so we're using a REST template to call the API. Um, and one thing that is special and yeah, it's a little getting used to, we have to pass the state between the different steps. Um, so here we are only performing the API call. We're not verifying anything. We're not checking for the status code. We're not checking for uh, what is in the response body. No, we're only doing the API call and some next steps, they will check for the status code and the actual body. Why do we do it this way? Well, we want to be able to reuse these steps. We want to avoid code duplication. We want to avoid that we have to write everything over and over again in every test we are writing. Now, as I said, the full code of this test is available on uh, GitHub, uh, so make sure you check it out. Um, but the next thing I want to show you is how this can help us to um, make, it make the business understand that we are actually doing the right thing. Uh, with a little configuration, we can make Cucumber generate reports that are really readable and understandable for 
non-technical people. Uh, this is a small example of a feature um, where we are retrieving some products from the product overview. Um, and as you can see, I pass some examples uh, to the scenario. This test is run three times with the parameters given uh, below. And we always check for the correct behavior. Um, and in case of failure, it's also clear for us. It even gives us a partial stack trace so that we know what we should be looking for. Now, OK, everything fine. Uh, the testing trophy is good. Behavior-driven driven development is good, especially in simple projects. Now, most of us won't be working on simple projects all the time. We are often dealing with legacy code or with microservices applications. And how can we use the things I discussed earlier in such, uh, in such case? How do we tackle this? Let's start with the easy part, yeah, the individual microservices. Um, yeah, each microservice should have its own test suite. And we can apply the testing trophy to every single microservice. We can apply behavior-driven development to every single microservice. But how do we test the integration between services? Because, yeah, that's kind of the most crucial part in microservices. So testing this is really necessary, but it can get quite complex. I've extended the previous example a little bit. Huh? Once an order gets created, uh, it's not only persisted in the database, we also send out a message to the warehouse system, which does his own things with it. Uh, for example, it can check that uh, the products that were ordered are available uh, or that the uh, stock should be replenished. Um, but also, yeah, the order will be persisted in the database for the warehouse. Um, yeah, if we want to test this, that can be quite hard. Um, we want to test that when an order is created, not only the order is persisted in the da database of the order system, but we also want to know that the warehouse system receives and processes the event correctly. Um, yeah, the, the test setup, it we could do it with end-to-end -end tests. That's possible because, yeah, when using end-to-end -end tests, we're most of the time running the tests against uh, an, a cloud environment, an online environment, or on an on-premise server. So we have an environment to test for. Um, but yeah, here we have to think about what happens when something goes down. How do we deal with outa outages? How do we deal with bad network performances, especially when you're in a conference? Um, and how do you deal with the setup of your test data? And how do you deal with the cleanup when everything is spread out to multiple microservices? In my opinion, there is no one-size-fits-all solution for this. Um, so it's up to the team we are working in to decide how you should be tackling it. Um, one thing that could help uh, is contract testing. Um, it's not a thing that I'm going to elaborate on. Um, there are people that know way more about it. Um, there were DevOps talks about it in the past. So just go to the YouTube, YouTube channel and uh, look for um, contract testing and they will uh, provide you with the, the information you need to get started. Now, ooh, time is good. Um, we're near the end of the talk, so we will even have time for some questions. Um, I want to recapitulate because it was a lot that we've been talking about. I want to recapitulate, uh, recapitulate a little um, so that you, again, know what we have been talking about. First of all, we talked about requirements and acceptance criteria. Um, the requirements should provide us with the context we need and the acceptance criteria. They have to follow certain rules. Um, we also talked about the power of code reviews and pair programming a little. And then obviously we talked a lot about the importance of automated testing. Sorry, I was forgetting to click. Um, and then last but not least, we talked about testing shapes like the testing pyramid and how and why we should move from the testing pyramid to the testing trophy, in my opinion. Uh, and we also touched behavior-driven development um, so that we know that we can go even further. Now, if you have any questions, I have a few slides left, just uh, um, raise your hand or 
I prefer that you come to me uh, so that we can talk about it uh, a little easier. Um, don't forget to rate this talk. Uh, it was my first time speaking on a conference like DevOps, uh, so I have a lot to learn, I know, but your feedback is of such high value for me, so please rate and uh, rate the, uh, uh, the talk in uh, the app and provide me with some feedback. If you want to talk to me some more, if you have some points that I have to look out for, just come over or talk to me in the hallway. Uh, I'm happy to learn from you guys also. And as promised, once more, the QR code. Um, you can scan it um, if you don't have uh, the time right now of, or you have to run to the, to to the toilet. Yeah, it will also be visible in uh, the slides. And the last thing I have to say is really thank you for being here, thank you for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed it. Initialize Genesis sequence.